Welcome back to the garage. In this video, we're gonna to put together the front and rear cantilever suspension and talk the basics of how they work. If you were looking at the model in the last couple of videos, you'd notice that the shock is not mounted here, it's mounted up here. And that's because I'm doing cantilever front and rear suspension. Let's be honest, you already saw the thumbnail and read the title, so you knew that was coming. Cantilever suspension does add a little bit of complexity into your system, but it also allows you to have more tunability if you have it set up correctly. Let's get this first side put together, we'll talk about how it works, and then I'll break down my design. Before we jump off the deep end talking about cantilever suspension, if you've enjoyed the build series so far and want to see more, please consider subscribing. It's the best way to help out the channel and it's free. Let's do it. So with the front driver's side put together here, you can see that the coilover is replaced with a push rod. The upper shock mount has been relocated and replaced with a bell crank. As the suspension compresses, it translates the movement through the push rod up into the bell crank the bell crank then pivots and allows us to redirect that force into a different direction. The bell crank pivots on a center pin and all the points on the outside travel in an arc because of that. No matter how far away these points are from the center of the bell crank, they will always travel the same angular distance. If this one is moved 10 degrees, then this one out here is moved 10 degrees. Since both these mounting points on the bell crank travel the same angular distance, that means the further away a point is from the center, the more tangential distance it will travel, or the more inches it will travel. And that relationship is what gives cantilever suspension its benefits. You can change how much your coilover moves in relation to the tire by just changing the distance of points in your bell crank. Now you might be thinking, Mitch, cool, that's great, but why would you want to change the ratio? If we look at our rear suspension, a coilover is typically mounted on the axle, attached to the frame, and you basically have one-to-one -one travel. So up on the front now, we have two things going on. The shock is mounted inboard on the pivot arm, and it is laid over on an angle. Both of those things give you loss of travel, and I made this little doohickey to help explain that. Here the shock is mounted vertical, and if we compress it one inch, you can see that we get one inch of travel. Now as the shock lays over more and more, you can see that it's traveling less and less. Now we swap to a control arm setup, and we move the end of the control arm one inch, we get half an inch of travel out of the shock. And that's because the mounting point of the shock is halfway to the end of the control arm. Now you add these two factors together and there is a lot of loss. You can see there's one inch of travel at the end of the control arm and we're getting three eighths of an inch of travel at the shock. So with that information, you can measure your suspension, calculate how much loss you have and compensate for that in your bell crank. And that is exactly what I have done here. This bell crank is set up for one inch of travel in the tire is going to be one inch of travel in the coilover. That one-to-one -one wheel travel lets me run a lighter duty spring in the front because we've eliminated that mechanical disadvantage and it all around makes the suspension more responsive. I'm sick of talking and you're probably sick of listening to me, so let's put some more stuff together.
from everything that I have seen, this design is pretty unique. And that's mainly due to the large shoulder bolt that I am using instead of a bolt with a bushing that is being supported on the end. So the magic with this bolt not needing to be supported on the other end is all in the mounting blocks that I have on the chassis. There is a counter bore with another drill bushing for a high tolerant surface for the shoulder bolt to go into. And this lets me bury the shoulder bolt down in there and give it as much strength as it can have. The main section of the bell crank I machined from 4140 and there is a drill bushing pressed in on each side. These drill bushings are incredibly strong, bored to a tight tolerance and fairly resistant to wear. And to help even more with the wear resistance, I have a bunch of these high load bronze washers. Bronze is a great bearing material because it has a high lubricity factor and it's pretty wear resistant. And there are one of these washers on each side of the bell crank bushing. So those are the basics of my design. And before we get finished mocking up the rear end here, I wanna show you one more thing about bell cranks. Depending on where your bell crank starts and ends in its travel, you can see some variation in your input length versus your output length. Now the extent of how much it differs depends on how far you travel past the center line of travel. There are two center lines in the bell crank. One is parallel to the push rod and the other is parallel to the shock. Since my shock is mounted at 90 degrees, my center lines are 90 degrees of each other. So basically the further you travel past that center line, the more angular deflection you're gonna get in your bell crank. You can use this effect to get dynamic spring rates. There's a whole complicated equation for it, but basically if you have your max travel and your minimum travel set at about the same distance off the center line, then you're gonna have pretty even spring rate. I don't know if your brain hurts, but mine does. So I'm gonna put the back together. for the rear cantilever is tacked up. So let's articulate this thing. Sweet. That is sweet. Bring you guys in for a closer view. I cannot wait to walk up to the bed of the truck, lean over and see this with coilovers. This thing is gonna be sick. There are a few little things left to do, like I need to bust out the TIG welder, weld up these seams, and I gotta lathe up these pieces and get the snap rings in there so these don't slide all over the place. But this thing's coming to life and I'm so excited for the next step, and that is removing it from the chassis jig and starting to move everything from the truck onto the new chassis. And there's barely over two months till the pro touring truck shootout. And this thing has to be running and driving on top of being able to race. To anyone who's in the Bowling Green, Kentucky area, I would definitely recommend coming to the event. I'm going to be competing in the ultimate truck class. So I am going to be doing basically everything in the event. I'll put a link to the shootout's website in the description so you can check it out if you'd like. But that's gonna be the end of this video. If you liked it, pop down in the comments and tell me what you think of this madness that I have created. But until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.